Hello, lovely people. And I have another really exciting guest on the Wellness Way today. I have a Dr. Perry Nicholson, who I came across on Instagram about 18 months ago, I think. And I have to say, this man just blew my mind. I was just like, mm. why is every doctor not talking like this man does? He's quite phenomenal. And, you know, there are times, as I've said, many times in my journey that I thought I'd gone mad. And then mm. you find people <laughs> that, that um, you know, make you realize that you're not alone. And this is a, a man mm. that has done that for me. So firstly, uh, Dr. Perry, thank mm. you so, so much for coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And trust me, you're not alone. I've been on that mad pathway for a long time. So I get you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to know. And we're all connecting together. And it's absolutely wonderful. Um, so before we start your story, because I'd love our, our audience to know about you and it's a fascinating mm. story could you just explain to us because in the UK uh, a, a chiropractor you go to and I've seen many chiropractors and you lie on a couch and they just kind of click some bones um, and when I say just that you know that's a big gig but they click bones but not really anything else so you're a chiropractic physician can you explain what that is what that means because you do a lot more than clicking bones yeah, that's a great question. So let me preface it to say that, yeah, I do way more than just chiropractic right now. So people always ask me, you know, what do you do? What's your profession? And I honestly hesitate to say chiropractic because they automatically go to this mental file folder of what they think that is. And I'm going to tell them you're going to be 100 percent wrong when you want to put me in that box. So <clears throat> or you'll you'll go by. You never saw one yourself, but you'll go by what you've heard or the stories of somebody have told you about one, right? And it's like any profession, you got good ones and you got bad ones, but it was my entryway into healthcare. So it's what I can put on my wall with a diploma that allows me to do things to people to heal them. But it's a very right. small part of what I do now. So the yeah, premise of chiropractic that I originally started with, and I love it, is you know I got into it because I got hurt physically in the world of bodybuilding and weightlifting. And like many people who associate chiropractic, it's easy with the lower back because it can be quite helpful with that. And I was debilitated and I really couldn't function for weeks at a time. And then my training partner at the time said, you should go see my chiropractor. I'm like, chiro what? I know what they were. And I went down there and got a treatment and I stood up and I felt significantly better. And then I thought to myself, wow, I mean, I, I'd like to do that too. So I decided to change my career path at the time, which I was study, going to be studying law. <laughs> a little bit of a shift there. A little bit and, of a shift uh, there. I went back to school and got the chiropractic. And it was great, but I quickly realized that there was more to it than that. It wasn't enough for me. And the basic premise is that they're trying to affect your nervous system or your spine and your spinal cord and your nerves by moving the structure that surrounds it, the, the spinal uh, column. Right. Yeah. And the premise is that you can have uh, what they call subluxations or fixations or misalignments or malalignments. I mean, you got so many words for it, but it basically means that things don't move as well as they should or some things move too much more than they should. So that's called hypomobility, which means something doesn't move enough or you have hypermobility, which means it moves too much. And you always have both. That's compensations and yin and yang and balance and how the universe works. And that if you can begin to impact those, you can make a difference in, in the quality of life for someone and begin to decrease pain, which it could. But I got frustrated because it was always just kind of going after one area at the time and usually where somebody pointed. So if yes. it hurts in your back, you go after your back. If it hurts you in your neck, your you go back. after your neck. I mean, and you should. Listen, you're supposed to look there because pain is telling you there's a problem, but unfortunately, it's not telling you what it is or where it is. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's never just one spot. But you should start there because it's the easiest way, easiest place to start. And then you, you slowly start to make it feel better. But I was like, that's great. But one, why is it not lasting? Why do I have to keep seeing somebody over and over and over? And I got frustrated. Why in the hell I got to see you so many times? Like, like you should be better, faster than you are right now in my mind, because the human body is designed to heal itself. And so what I, I stepped back and I realized that, well, 
you know, I'm seeing them for a brief moment at a time and they're usually in a snapshot and I'm treating them on a table where they're lying down. And then these people have to get up and walk out the door into this thing called real life where they have habits and behaviors and nutrition and environment and emotions and toxicities and all sorts of stuff like that. And plus they got to move. So yeah. maybe they're doing movements that are not the most efficient for them at the moment in time that they need. And that's causing some of the issues that they have. So I realized I have a lot of work to do here in relationship to looking at those factors, but then also branching outside of just taking care of the spinal column, which you should, it should be on the list of the checkbox, but there's a lot more boxes you need to check off. Yeah, I, my journey um, took me, I ended up, I had a tumor in my throat, as most people know now. And uh, I ended up, so I did go to a doctor and I ended up seeing four consultants, four days running. And I kept asking them if everything was connected. And just as you said, you know, they they don't know, they're not taught. So it's like, I'm going to cut your tumor out and I'm sorry, you're going to lose half your thyroid. I'm going to operate on your frozen shoulder. I'm going to wire your brain up because you can't remember anything. Uh, and I just went, no, um, I'm going to go and heal myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the journey that I started on. And it's quite shocking how allopathic medicine do not connect the whole body. I mean, really, well, that's what frustrates me. me because I'm like, didn't you read the same freaking books that I read? I mean, I read the same ones you read. I didn't come to that conclusion that you can just isolate anything. And then even if you do need surgery, which sometimes you do, right? I mean, I tell people, listen, if your arm's hanging off, you're not going to come see me for a lymphatic treatment, but you better see me after they put that sucker back on. Um, is that you got to ask why? I mean, why did it manifest there? Why did it manifest that way for you? And you, you got to look for, you know, not just what to do for something and when to do it, but why it was an issue in the first place. The and you're only going to get that from talking to an individual, observing an individual, listening to an individual. And then I get into the hands-on treatment because there's things that I'm going to be able to feel with my hands that you're never, ever going to find on any kind of test that you do in a lab. I'm going to stand by that until I'm dead. I've got people that come out with normal blood work all the time and they can't get out of bed. You get people that have normal MRIs or x-rays and they can't function. And then they say, well, there's nothing wrong with you. Well, obviously your nervous system and your brain or your body thinks that there is. And then, so I'm only going to get a read on that when I put somebody on the table and I start to use my hands to go through an assessment, a particular assessment that I do. And it even starts by, me looking at the reaction that they have in their nervous system and on their face when I even touch them. Yes, very, very, very A lot true. of times, yeah, a lot of times I'll, I'll touch an area of the body that they're not complaining of physical pain on, but I see the threat response coming through that they don't know they're sending out. So yeah, I know no, I, that, yeah, I, sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I know that their nervous system is stuck in a fight or flight protective mode. And it's really difficult to heal when you're stuck in a fight or flight mode because your your body's either in growth mode, right, growing, or it's in defense mode. It ain't going to be in both at the same time. And it's not going to let you grow uh, until you survive because it's really hard to grow when you're dead. You follow? <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> that's the ultimate goal. So when you, listen, when you understand this one thing, that the number one goal of your body is survival and not dying and energy conservation, using the least amount of energy to accomplish that goal. And it's going to compensate and adapt to accomplish that goal. You can figure anything out. You, you really can. You just have to find the strategy that the person took. And here's where it gets, where people get lost is because somebody can have the same diagnosis, but they have a different strategy on getting there. You understand? So yeah. the treatment programs can't be, you know, person who have this diagnosis, you all get the same treatment. No. Can you talk to us a little bit about autoimmune diseases? Because they're very common now. I, I mean, I didn't know anybody when I was a child with an autoimmune disease. Right. Uh, and now everybody has an autoimmune disease. So can you just talk us through that, what you think is going on here? And one word, it's inflammation. Right. Sorry, I missed that word. Inflammation. Yeah, right. yeah. So... And Every autoimmune disease is inflammation. It's just manifesting itself in different names for different people. So infl inflammation is the culprit, but 
you're gonna you would manifest it as fibromyalgia somebody else may manifest it as celiac disease because that just depends okay. on your genetic makeup your history and your vulnerability in your body and in your life of where it so it's because anytime you have inflammation or to the body or you have a parasite or a bacteria it's always going to go after your weakest link and so that so when you talk about parasites and i'd actually like to talk about parasites as well because they're not very often spoken about when you're healing a body but you know everything i i would say and you know there was a study from harvard not that long ago that even cancer heart disease everything is inflammation in the body yeah that's right um and um I'm I'm less convinced by DNA affecting it than a lot of people um, having read the book Biology of Belief. Do you know oh, Dr. Yeah. Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief? Um, so I'm I'm um, he's fascinating on DNA. But what do you think are the main drivers for this inflammation? Do you think it's I, I know it's everything, but do you think anything stands out? like toxicity or trauma or is there any one massive driver that you can see for this inflammation that's going on in the world at the moment trauma and emotions are always a factor always right you'll find that many people who come down with an autoimmune disease you know it usually is preceded by some catastrophic event in their life or perceived catastrophic event let me put it to you that way like like a death of a loved one, a divorce, a loss of a job or something. Because people are barely hanging on to the edge of the cliff by their fingernails anyway, with the mm. amount of stress coming at us. <clears throat> stress is always a factor too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can only hold so much water in your stress bucket. And then all of a sudden one drop, it overflows. And then your whole life adding to that stress bucket, it just overflows. So th there's always going to be some type of emotional component to it. And you're going to hold that in the body somewhere. Is yeah. emotions and feelings change physiology always. Um, and it's the toxicity. It's the toxicity of your mental thoughts, your social culture, the, the environment that you live. And that's epigenetics. That's what that means. You know, yep, genetics yep. loads up the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger. That's the Lipton line, right? Absolutely. You can yep. have two different people with the same genetics and then they're in different environments and then they get different outcomes from their physiology. So your thought process makes a big difference in your, in your healing. <clears throat> that's placebo nocebo type effects and so you got the toxicity of thoughts which is a big one the ones that you tell yourself honestly but the ones that you tell yourself are usually been downloaded by some most toxic people in your life you've had that are coming back to visit you or stuff that happened years ago that you maybe you don't remember or is hidden down in there as you know from your first seven six to seven years of life Yep. And then you have in, the toxicity in, of the modern in EFT, world. Yeah. In EFT, right. we call that the wall, the first seven years of your life, because yep. it's the bricks of the wall, you know, your family, your friends, your aunts and uncles, your religion, your schooling. You know, there's a lot of toxic stuff builds that wall that programs you and forms all of your limiting beliefs that you will carry with you until you choose to... Um, to get them out, you know, and, and that's right. a lot of work in itself is to actually work on those limiting beliefs. You know, the main one being I'm not enough, um, right. you know, one that I had for many, many years and still crops up now. You know, I mean, we don't ever get over these. We don't ever heal. We're never nope. at the end. Um, well, God, Gabor Mate says the same thing with his stuff. The first six, seven years of life is to hit your, your blueprint, if you will. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, that, that you hold that you hold on to. But many people don't know that. Right. So there's this thing called awareness because you can't change something until you become aware of it. So stuff changes all the time. But if you want to have a role in it, you can't change it until you become aware of it. So it's realizing that something may have happened to you in those first seven years that the light bulb goes off. And then you have to be at a point in your life where you're ready to accept that. And if you're not, that means you're not sick enough yet. Um, yes. And then then it'll then it'll come to you. Because then you got you got nobody else left, right? So you have those toxic those toxic thoughts, and you have the toxicity of the modern world of everything coming at you with every preservative and toxin and sprays and you know stuff you put into your body from your medications to your immunizations to everything that you've gone through. And the human body is like, you're kidding me, right? Like, you expect <laughs> me to take care of all this stuff? I mean, I was never designed to take care of all this stuff, and you keep putting it in. Like one of the first rules of recovery is to 
when you want to detoxify the body, stop putting the freaking toxins in a little bit. Yep. Yep. Right? Absolutely. And then you deal with it on the back end. It's kind of like, mom, it hurts when I do that. Well, stop doing that. Your mom would tell you. It's the same thing with this one. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I remember when my daughters were at school and, you know, January would come, which I don't think is a good time of year to detox in the UK because you're meant to be in your cave. But, you know, all these mums at school would be going, oh, I'm doing my New Year's detox. And they turn up at school with shitloads of fucking makeup on. And I kind of go, yeah. well, you're not detoxing. You've got 126 chemicals on your face. <laughs> right. And it's again, it's looking at the whole picture. Yeah, it's uh, a cumulative effect, too. It, it's everything, uh, you know, the amount, but it's also the interactions. Yes. And this is another thing that I think is really important. Over 80,000 chemicals have been licensed for use worldwide. Um, that figure was when I wrote my book. It's most probably another 80,000 on top now in the year 2020. Mm. And yet no research is done on how they react with each other. None That's at true. all. No. So, you know, you might go, well, this is safe to use, but you have no idea if it's safe to use with everything else you've got going on in your life. Yeah, and, and it's so, virtually impossible to do it because there's so many combinations, right? Yeah, and then yeah. plus you gotta you gotta depend on where you live. I mean, in the United States, they let you put stuff in your food and in your body that most countries have outlawed. And I'm like, what the hell's up with that? And mm. maybe there's a reason why we're the, one of the sickest nations in the world and one of the most obese and one of the most uh wrought with mental disorders and neurodegenerative disorders and autism, and all these sorts of things. Maybe you start to look at the fish tank you're living in. Of yes. how clean that water is. And I'm pretty sure it ain't going to be. I'm not, I'm, I'm talking water literally, but I'm talking about the environment that you're in. Yeah, I saw the movie. Um, I don't know if you've seen the film about Teflon, uh, Dark Waters, where they forever poisoned the world's waterways with Teflon. And I used to think Teflon was just in a frying pan and I got rid of mine years mm -hmm. ago. And then I discovered it was in my kid's school uniform. And you go, why have they put Teflon in my kids' school uniforms? And it's yeah. because you don't have to iron in. It's like, I'd rather get an iron out, thank you, and have my children safe. That's great. You want me to give you guys, your listeners a little bit of a tip? Yes, please. And this me. This I learned from studying Eastern medicine a lot, which, you know, I study all different disciplines because I like to understand their thinking process. You just have to realize every single one of them is trying to go for the same destination on helping a human being. They're just taking different pathways to do it and using different yep. language, but they're all kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. So uh, in Eastern medicine, they'll tell you that the center of all connective tissue fascia in the body and the, the center of a lot of your emotions will happen at the navel, at the belly button, because that's the, that's you cut some, it's the root of life. Like yep. you wouldn't be here without it because that's where you were attached to your mother. And then all the connective tissue fascia through the whole body spirals out from there like a star. And if you have tension around the navel, that can cause pain anywhere in the body. And nobody's going to check the navel because nobody ever comes and says, Doc, I got to see you today. My navel's killing me. No. no. They usually feel it in the back and everybody's gone after the back. And then I'm like, and I say to them, I jokingly say, is anybody ever stuck their fingers in your belly button yet? I haven't had a single person say yes. <laughs> and then my joke is I'm saying, we're about gonna, and you're always going to remember your first. <laughs> so what, what they tell you in Eastern medicine is to spend 15 to 20 minutes every day massaging around the navel and a few inches out from there and you'll change your life. Oh my goodness. Okay. So run me through that because I don't do that. I do your, um, so I'm just undoing my trousers now. I'm sorry. I, excuse me, everyone. So, you are rubbing around the navel. Do you ever put your finger in your navel or is that yeah, like so, sticking your you finger know, in your ear? This is something that we teach. This is something that we teach in our, our courses, you know, pretty much every course and in our visceral course, visceral means organs. Um, <clears throat> but you always start uh, inside the navel, just inside the ring. Right okay. there. And it you tickles. need to, yeah, you need to think of the navel is I always say, I think of it is like times on a clock. So if the top of the navel is 12 o'clock at the bottom of the navel is six o'clock. Yep. And if, if I'm looking at you like this, that's how I'm visioning yep. the clock. So 12 at the top and then over on the left hand side would be your what? 
Hang on, your left hand side or my left hand side? Your left. My yeah. left hand side would be. Um, so it's going to be three o'clock, right? Three o'clock, yeah. And then the right hand side would be nine o'clock. Nine o'clock. And then if you if you go to the top left corner, that's one thirty. Yep. If you go to the bottom right hand corner, that's seven thirty. Yep. Yeah. So you got to envision the clock that you're looking at your body. So I want yep. you to envision that you're staring at your navel as someone looking at you. That's how you, you have to remember where you are. And then the top right corner is 1030. Bottom right corner is 430. Yep. So what you do is you start on the ring and then you always go. I don't care where you start, but you always go opposites. So if I start at 12, then I go to six. If I start six. at three, then I go to nine. Oh, yes. All the way opposites through at the ring. And then you start to work your way out the same time zones. Then you work your way out to about two inches around the navel. Or that's six centimeters for you, I think. Brilliant. Sorry, I'm just doing it. It's gone very quiet here on the podcast. It feels really lovely. Yeah, you just take, you know, if you got nails, you have to use your finger beds or you, nobody said you got to use your hand. You can use, they have, they make navel massagers. They're not easy to find in the, in, unless you're in the Eastern countries, but you can also use anything. I tell people, take the smooth back end of a freaking spatula. I don't care what you use. I need to get around that navel and work it all the time. And you're probably going to say to yourself, holy cow, that freaking hurts. And the first yeah. thing I'm going to tell you is it's not supposed to hurt. <clears throat> No, mine didn't hurt, but I'm quite healthy. That means you need it, <laughs> right? And it just so happens that the abdominal region is where most of your blood flow and most of your lymphatic system flows, and they're going to always be backed up when you have chronic disease and autoimmune. And now I have to, I cannot have you on a podcast and not talk to you about how you're doing for time. Are you okay for a little bit longer? Because there are yeah, two things that I need to talk to you about. So vagus nerve. Um, I didn't really know about the vagus hurt nerve at the beginning of my healing journey for a long time, but I knew everybody around me used to go completely mental because I was humming the whole time. Mm. And they go, why are you humming? Can you just stop humming? For God's sake, stop humming. And I didn't realize I was. And it was only when I started learning about the vagus nerve that I realized the vagus nerve was trying to connect my gut and my brain because I had such severe brain fog that mm. it was just trying to kind of protect itself. Uh, and yet it wasn't spoken about very much, but even less than the vagus nerve, which is now, you know, a bit of a, a vibe this year is the lymphatic system. And mm. I knew nothing about this until I started following your work. So mm. thank you so much. And I'm loving doing my, my lymph massages every day. That, there you go. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. I have my my oils and I do them and I start you know kind of there and then I go to there and I do my Perfect. neck and I do my tummy and I do my groin and I do the back of my knees and your six points um six, and then right. I yeah and then I do kind of brushing up my legs uh and I'm and you know kind of sometimes I think oh I don't have time to do this and it's a luxury no it's not a luxury it's a bloody mm. necessity so please please talk to us about those two systems Sure. I'd be happy to. Well, there are two of the things that I work with first. So yeah. I have a hierarchy of treatment of the systems that I look at. <clears throat> Number one is the nervous system, because I have to take you out of a fight or flight or a shutdown mode. Right. And the number one nerve that I work on to do that is the vagus nerve. And Lots of people are talking about it now because people feel results and plus they're devoting some research to it, which is nice to see. But the vagus nerve is what they call a cranial nerve because it comes off the the brain stem and the and the back. <clears throat> Actually a little bit further down in your medulla. Yeah, medulla. Um and you've got a right one and you got a left one and it goes from your brain down your neck, down your sternum, along your esophagus to the organs of your body. And it's the conduit of organs coming up and brain going down. It's a two way street. And the reason that nerve is important is because it's the number one nerve co to control the inflammatory response in the body. Yeah. And it's the number one nerve to take you out of a fight or flight response by streamlining and increasing your parasympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> so nerves have what they call signals to them or signalization. And 
their strength and the ability to deliver a signal to and from something is known as tone. Okay. Another word for it is tone. Yeah. And think about it like a muscle. You can have a muscle that has normal tone and everything's great. You can have a muscle that has high tone, which means it's in spasm and it's overworking. And you can have a muscle that's hypotonic, which is basically flat, flaccid, and nothing to it, loosey-goosey. And nerves can be the same thing. So the vagus nerve is usually hypo. It, it's got low tone, which means your parasympathetic nervous system is not keeping up with the ability to control the sympathetic system. Yes. Right? So when you're stuck in a fight or flight response, you got a couple of different options here. One, you can try to decrease the stress response, get away from the stressor, which is decreasing the sympathetic response, right? So you're decreasing sympathetics. But, you know, you can also get away from that by increasing your parasympathetics. So when you increase parasympathetics, sympathetics go down. So that's a case of remove yourself from the stressor and pay attention to your parasympathetic nervous system. Sometimes it's not enough just to remove yourself from the stressor anymore because you have you've got a low tone in your vagus nerve. And singing and humming is one of the greats and it's also kind of mimics chanting and chanting is very tribal, right? And and om, the power of om, right. you know, the om. Un universe. Om has yeah. a vibration to it and you'll feel it in your throat and your sternum. So it vibrates the vagus nerve, but it also will vibrate your energy chakras too, right? Yes. And and from a Western perspective, you're going to vibrate your fascia, okay? Um, yeah. <clears throat> so you, you want to work that nerve to help increase the tone, right? In, in neurology, they have a saying, you know, do what you can't do. <laughs> <laughs> do what you can't do. And that's a simple premise of rehab. And that'll help get you to where you need to be. But you can't do too much. Because the nerves have to be able to absorb the stimulation. So you can overstimulate the vagus nerve and make no progress. Right. Okay. In the same way that if you go to a gym um, on New Year's Day and you do a five hour workout because you're on a New Year's mm -hmm. resolution, you've just caused a huge amount of stress to your body and put it in trauma because it's not used right. to it. So so if you over a perfect example, if you overload the system and you put it into a threat response, what behaviors are going to go back to? Fight the ones fight. you're trying to get away from. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's what it's gone to in the past. So I'm just going to do it again. Yeah. Right. So you you get you can't do too much vagus nerve work. That's one of the reasons why breathing from your diaphragm is so great because it moves your organs with stimulates your vagus nerve and it also increases blood flow in the abdomen and moves your lymph. But people who have vagus nerve issues get poor blood flow to the gut because that's the signal down. The biz biggest signal from the vagus nerve down is for blood flow. And the biggest signal of the vagus nerve is up from the abdomen to give the brain a sense of uh, what's happening in the, in the uh, abdominal region. So 80% of the vagus nerve goes from the belly up, 20% goes down. So what I find is that people pay too much attention to the belly part. They don't talk about the top part. So that's why people who've had concussions or brain injury or trauma or stuff like that usually have uh, top down issues as well as bottom up issues. <clears throat> but the beautiful thing is, is that, you know, when you can decrease the stress response, you decrease tension. Right? Yes. Yeah. Because when you have excess tension in the body, that tightens up tissue. When you tighten up tissue, you restrict fluid flow everywhere. Yes, Absolutely particularly blood flow and lymph flow. If you want to know how that works is make a fist for, for five minutes and let me know how your hand feels. It ain't going to feel so good because no, it's got it too much numb. tension in there and you got yeah. white knuckles and it can't breathe and it's yeah. going to hurt. So anytime you have pain in a region, for me, you got poor, you got blood flow problem, you got a lymph flow problem because they always go together. <clears throat> so yes. that's why if you decrease tension in the body through the vagus nerve work, you automatically improve lymph flow because you decrease tension. But the lymphatic system is number two because the lymphatic system is part of your primary detoxification system to remove toxins from the body that get out from in, but also the toxins that your own body generates through metabolic processes and breaking down food and creating energy. Anytime you create energy, you have waste. So yes. your cells, now, I... which you have a couple of trillion of them, make waste every day. And I think it's really important. The one thing that I learned the most 
important thing I learned about the lymphatic system. Uh, and, this, and I learned a fraction of it when I wrote my book. And then I've learned a whole bunch more from you since. Um, and I think I actually quoted you in my book and I didn't know it was from you. I heard it from somebody else. So I'm really sorry about that. It was about flushing out the lymph flu. But is that your line, flushing, flushing out the out lymph the what? flu? Flushing out the lymph flu. No, that's not me. No, it's not. Okay. It's a good okay. analogy. Yeah. Good. It's flush your toilet. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Just flushing out the lymph flu because we don't do that. We're not. Yeah. I, I knew nothing <clears throat> about it whatsoever until I started this journey. Well, I guess it is me. I just don't call it a lube. I call it a toilet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a great analogy. So, when yeah, I learned a long time ago when I tried to, you know, improve my teaching and is that if you're trying to explain a new concept to people, you have to tie it to a concept they already get. Yes. So if I say that if your toilet backs up and you keep flushing the toilet, all that waste is going to overflow in your bathroom and it's going to be awful and smell awful. So if the same thing with the lymph, you know, those nodes are called lymph nodes are basically 600 mini toilets in the body that are flushing out waste. And if you got to clear the block. You just got to get in there and plunge your toilet or snake your toilet, or maybe you got to block somewhere at the street and you got to get somebody to come and fix it that I don't care how much you flush your toilet. If you don't clear the block, you're not going to get where you need to go. And but that's it's what you really have to do. Important to, yeah. It's really important to know that say, you know, the blood has the heart to keep it pumping. We have no organ for the lymph whatsoever. Do we? Yeah. So the primary thing that moves lymph or two things movement movement so that's why people who lay in bed a lot you know get what they call stasis or stagnation you get swelling and inflammation and edema and um so you got to move right that's why walking is one of the best forms of stuff to, to help you and the other one is breathing through the diaphragm yes and the reason that is, is that breathing through the diaphragm increases what they call intra-abdominal pressure that's pressure in the abdomen and when you increase pressure there, you drive organ movement and you move the lymph that's in the abdomen up towards the bottom of the neck of the collarbone, which is where it's trying to go. Right. Yeah. So most people don't move in today's world, or if they do, they do the same kind of movement all the time and they don't change it up, which could be just as bad because the body's tissues conform to line of stress. So fluid flows in one in one place better than another because you always do the same kind of movements all the time. It's kind of yeah. like water flowing in nature. You ever see water go to a certain way and it forms that way? Well, it's going to stay that way until you change it. So that's why you got to move yourself. And then most people don't breathe through the diaphragm. And so I'm a breathwork coach as well. Uh, and there are lots of different techniques out there for breathing. So, um, you know, I tend to stick mainly to soma, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth, but deep into mm. the diaphragm. Wim Hof obviously does mouth breathing. What's your tip on on breathing, nose or mouth? Well, I'm straightforward. I'm from the Patrick McCone oxygen advantage world and the Biteco nose. breathing that your nose is meant for one thing and it's freaking breathing, yeah. right? So. But I, I also, I never breathe in through the mouth with my work, but when I'm working with people who have autoimmune, chronic disease, stuff like that, because all breathing techniques, it just depends on what you're trying to accomplish from the breathing technique. Like okay. what's your goal? What's your task? What state are you in? Because sometimes you want to breathe through your mouth, depending on if I, if I want to go hashtag beast mode monster and I got to climb a freaking mountain. I may have to, you understand? But otherwise I need to, to train people to go in and out through the nose primarily. But I go in through the nose and I go out through the mouth a lot because I like for people to change the shape of their mouth to make different sounds when they breathe out because it changes the shape of your tongue, which also influences the nerve in your brain. So you heal faster, plus you have the feedback of the sound. So that's organ breathing that's in uh, Qigong and Eastern medicine that I practice a lot. <clears throat> so I'll go in through, but the biggest thing that I'll tell people is just try to focus more on in through the nose and out through the nose taping your mouth shut at night so you can breathe absolutely through your nose. but here's what i found it's very difficult to breathe in and out through your nose when you have a congested lymphatic system because you have too much mucus yes and the reason you got why do you got too much mucus well i'll tell you why you got too much mucus your body's laying down a protectant to try to cover something and protect you so you got to figure out what it's protecting you from not stop the, not just try to stop the mucus so i already that, know you got toxins in there if you got mucus 
So then I want to try to work the lymphatic system and then clear those nodes so it can drain the toilet. And the next thing you know is, holy crap, yeah, I can breathe through my nose again, which is a good thing. Yeah, no, that's, so, that's really, really good advice. And the lymphatic system drains into the veins of the body. It drains into the circulatory system. So lymphatics are the second part of your circulatory system. So if you have a circulation blood flow problem, you have a lymph problem, hard start, period, zero discussion. If you have, it goes both ways because they always work with each other. And when one doesn't work well, it changes pressure somewhere in the body. And when you change pressure somewhere in the body, you change how energy is transferred and you change blood flow and you change tension and you're going to get pain somewhere. Right. So, so if you've got something like Raynaud's syndrome, where your hands, you lose the blood in your hands in winter, mm -hmm. that's connected to your lymphatic system as well. Absolutely. 1000%. It's also good. I mean, I know everything's connected. System. I know everything's connected, but you should really be looking because I actually, I haven't had it for a couple of years, but I used to have terrible Raynards. Right. Um, so I just used to put rosemary oil on uh, or put my hands in stinging nettles to get yeah. the, um, <laughs> the blood flowing. <laughs> so That's great. Actually, That's perfect. But yeah. actually I should be doing more lymph massage. Yeah. So here's what, here's what you need to understand is that, you know, the, the ends of the hands and the ends of the feet are, you know, have the greatest pressure in the body because they're the end points. And if you've got swelling or inflammation in your hands and your feet or poor blood flow, the next question I ask people is where does all that swelling and inflammation have to go when back you try to treat the body. it? Yeah, it's got to go back. It's got to go eventually out, right? Because it's, it's, it's waste is what it is. So all the inflammation in your hand has got to travel up to the exit point of your lymph at the collarbone, right? Yep. So you're trying to send it to the collarbone and then, but what if you have a blockage at the collarbone or somewhere else? You can't, it won't get there because you're sending the hand into a place that it can't get past because there's and blockages And that's where there. it gets stuck. Your toilet's and that's blocked. Where you, yeah, and that's where it manifests. Right. And, and becomes, then what happens is where's the fluid? Ease. Yeah. Where's the fluid going to go? Right back to your hand. Right. But you also need to get the blood flow to your hand. And then I'm going to say, where does the blood flow to your hand come from? And you get, you better be telling me your heart. And then yes. I'm going to say, how does it get down to your hand? <laughs> Same exact pathway the lymph gets out. It's just going in the opposite direction. So you still so you have just... to start. Moral of my story is you never start in your hand. No, you always no, start at the collarbone it, and the chest and you work your way down to your hand. That's yes. the strategy. It's not the same thing. It's completely different if you start in your hand. Yes, yes, yes. Of understand? Course. So yes. it's not just what you do. It's where you do the, it that matters. And the order you do it in. Because yeah, I'm that not thinking complete sense. painful hand. Like you got rain owls, but then I have to think about what do the cells in your hand need to get better? They need nutrients and oxygen, and they're going to get that through what? Blood. Blood. So blood's yeah. got to get in. And then the cells are going to use that stuff and then make new cells and repair cells. And it's got to get rid of the waste that's there from making new cells and from your injury, right? So the waste has got to go where? Out. Out. Yeah. If you don't have nutrients in and waste out, I don't care what the hell you do. Nothing's going to get better, but you have to know the pathway of where it comes from. That's the key. That's yeah. really, really, I'm going to tell you right now in my world, that's the difference between your therapy working and not working, depending that's on where yeah. you start. And I'll stand yeah. by that because I see it every single day. So it, when I talk to people about doing work to your ankle or doing work to your hand. I'm not saying you can't work those regions. If you have a system that's relatively functional, you should be able to do whatever the hell you want to do. But if you have a lot of inflammation, a lot of pain, a lot of poor blood flow, stuff like that, you can't start there. You can't, you can't, yeah. you have to start in the center and work down because you, because I'm going to ask why in the hell are your hand and your feet a mess in the first place? Yeah, no, because absolutely. You got a problem I mean in the center. That's why. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of detoxing when I do my detoxes, you know, the body's like a funnel. Uh, and you know, if your colon isn't working <clears throat> properly and your bowels, then, you know, don't 
detox your liver and everything because it's just going to back up and you know you have to get the whole system going and yet when it came to Reynards I was just putting oils and stinging nettles on so thank you for that yeah well that's great though thank you're you. doing more than most people which is good but I'm still going to start no matter I didn't what go diagnosis I didn't go to a doctor <laughs> yeah you know whatever somebody diagnosis gives me I'm going to do the same first two things vagus nerve and lymph work brilliant I always I, do the top two all the, all the time. That's my checklist. And then I see what changes from there. And then I can, I can alter my course from doing those first two, but I have to check those boxes off first. Yeah. And, and just thank you so much for all the work, everything I've learned from you. I still have so much to learn. And so this is just so, such an honor for me to interview you and have this conversation. I can't tell you, uh, Dr. Perry, thank you so much. Before you go, and I know that we're out of time, but before you go, could you just uh, tell the audience where to find you? I know you have some phenomenal courses online uh, mm. and you do a lot of online work. So can you just let the audience know how that they can find you? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. And first of all, I really enjoyed my time. I can't believe it went by so fast. I think no, we hit I know. The, the energy vibrational flow state, <laughs> if you will. Uh so yes, uh, it's very easy to find me if you just type in "stop chasing pain" that we were talking about before. I'm going to show up somewhere. My Brilliant. website should show up there, and that's the central hub to find everything that we do, from uh, seeing clients and patients that I do in person and virtually still, but just a few days a week. And then we have a membership site where people can come on in and get lost in about a thousand videos of stuff to do, and then uh, all of our workshops that we do online of all different types. And it's important for me to tell people that it's open to all human beings of any level that they're in, healthcare professionals, everyday people. It's just designed for humans that want to feel better and not suffer so much and get some answers outside some some traditional ways that they're looking at it or be able to change their thought process on uh, how they're looking at their their what the, what they're coming in with and what they have. So just go there and uh, I probably spend at this point what might be considered an unhealthy amount of time on Instagram. But you know, <laughs> Don't <there>. we all? <laughs> yeah. And I have TikTok too, but I'm just branching so into I. that one. So I haven't done much on there, but that'll grow as I get a little more comfortable with the format. Oh, um, I love TikTok. Apart from they took me down, but um, <laughs> other than that, I love TikTok. <laughs> Yeah, good for you. Congratulations. Just, there's there's just there's a young vibe there and just as much, you know, you can reach more people. So for me, it's just as much information as as any of us can get out. You know, yeah. we're all here for the for the end game of just getting out this information to people. And yeah. for, and you know, that's why I've started the podcast. And for that reason, Dr. Perry Nicholson, stop chasing pain. It has been a complete and utter joy. Will you come back? Because we haven't touched the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> I certainly will. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.